Hello, everyone. I'm Raphael Chacon, director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and it's a pleasure to welcome you back to Bookish Reveals. And this is, sadly enough, the final installment of our seven-part program in which we've been discussing the artist's book as a genre. Uh, but first, it's important to acknowledge that the Montana Museum of Art and Culture is on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. And today we honor the path that they've always showed us in caring for this place for generations to come, to which we at the museum like to add that art has always been a part of this place. We also want to send a shout out to all our healthcare professionals and our first responders making extraordinary sacrifices during this time of national crisis. Uh, so before I describe today's program and introduce our final speaker, allow me to thank our generous sponsors. The Montana Arts Council and Humanities Montana, uh, whose distribution of CARES Act dollars has really made uh, this program possible. I also want to thank our wonderful cinematographer, Eileen Rafferty, who is presently behind the camera. Thanks, Eileen. You've been a great sport for this series. <laughs> uh, the program, this program coincides with an exhibition, and that's uh, taking place at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture here in Missoula, Montana. The show is titled Bookish Selections from the Dan Weinberg Collection. And the show, um, sadly enough, closes on December 12th, so in, uh, in short order. Um, and uh, it is still on view on, until the 12th in the Henry Malloy Gallery at the university's PARTV Center. Uh, the exhibition uh, features a remarkable array of illustrated books uh, by notable artists and authors. And these are all the works of New York City publisher Vincent Fitzgerald. And the works, as many of you know, were collected by Senator Dan Weinberg of Montana. Um, if you missed the exhibition, uh, you can check out our virtual tours of the show uh, or uh, the actual books being open page by page. And these are all posted on our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to see the, uh, the virtual tour, uh, go to our webpage, and that's at umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum, umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. So today's guest is gallery owner and literary critic, Dr. Lisa Simon, and she's going to address the book, the book you see here, Parables and Pieces by Franz Kafka in the Weinberg Collection. When Dr. Simon is finished with her presentation, and if there's time, we'll read questions from the audience. So I invite you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to read your questions aloud uh, at the end of the program. This program is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, if you wish to return to it or if you wish to invite your friends to, uh, to see it. So Lisa Simon is a humanities scholar. She's also an art activist and a gallery owner in Missoula, Montana. She holds a PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle. And her research investigated engaged community building of artists during the heyday of literary modernism about 100 years ago, roughly at the time that this book was written, or the books uh, were written. Uh, Simon is the co-editor of and a contributing writer of These Living Songs, Reading Montana Poetry, published in 2014. And this is the first collection of critical essays on Montana's rich history of poetry. As a scholar, uh, Dr. Simon earned a Yale Fellowship for Research and was designated a Humanities Hero by Humanities Montana for her work in literary advocacy all around the state. From 2011 to 2015, Simon created and produced over a thousand episodes of a weekly radio program on the literature of the West called Reflections West. It's a hundred. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I say a thousand? A thousand. Oh, I wish there were a thousand. Is so, that how this interview is going to go? <laughs> yes, hyperbole, hyperbole, hyperbole. So, a hundred episodes, and the program is called Reflections West. And I have to admit, uh, this is one of my favorite programs on Montana and Yellowstone Public Radio. Uh, it's a Thank terrific you. program, and I'm glad it's uh, very much on the air these days. So in 2014, um, Lisa Simon and her partner Jason Neal opened up the Radius Gallery in downtown Missoula to showcase contemporary art and to encourage a forum for discussions of art and its vitality in our world today. Uh, the book that she's going to reveal, which we have in front of us, is Franz Kafka's Parables and Pieces. Uh, this edition was translated by Michael Feingold, who we'll hear more about him shortly. 
and it was published by Vincent Fitzgerald in 1990. It also contains gorgeous photo reviewers by Judith Turner. Uh, so let's hear more about this publication and Franz Kafka, who is also with us. Um, so welcome, Dr. Simon. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, so we're going to look at this book, which is a little mysterious. It, it suggests that it is a book that's going to have Kafka and Turner as equal billings. There it is on the spine. And Raphael, you were saying that when you looked it up, Turner seemed to be a, a big part of it. But that, um, that becomes problematic early on when you actually reveal the book. Here's our big reveal. It's called Parables and Pieces. Um, let's get it out of its parables and pieces. But there's no real, like if you Googled, oh, I want to go read Parables and Pieces by Kafka, it, this isn't the book you would get. There's really no such book called this in publication except this. Um, so you're already like wondering who is the authority of this book, who is behind it. And as you open it up and get into these, and, and I should say these pages are just beautiful. The paper is gorgeous, um, and it's very artful. Um, and so translations by Michael Feingold. And he's not on the spine anywhere, but as we get into the book and move through its linearity, you see that Feingold has a, a much bigger role. Um, but he is, he's positioned himself behind these two in a really interesting way. So really, there's a triumvirate here. We have Kafka as the original author, we have Feingold as the translator, and Judith Turner is responsible for the art, the photo reviewers, right? Yes. She's a photographer? He, she's a photographer. And you would think that, like, if this were an ordinary book, that the photography would be somehow illustrating the work, and the translator would just have the role of I'm going to take these words from German, which um, Kafka originally wrote in, and I'm going to turn them into English. Um, but his role is much more strong than that. This is not just a book. This is a reading. This is an interpretation, sort of like um, reading in the sense of reading your poem or reading something other than um, uh, words on a page. This is interpretive. And it is um, Feingold who's the maker. Um, and so the word translator doesn't capture his role. The word editor doesn't capture his role. It's a combination of those two. So really, the publication we're looking at is its own work of art. It's Absolutely. not Kafka. It's not Turner. It's not Feingold. It's really yeah. a, a kind of uh, a, a, third, a third route, a third yes. venue. And the, the captain of that ship seems to be Feingold. Although I'm, I'm surmising by that by um, actually the introductory um, essay that he wrote. I can see how his positions that he writes in this essay are the controlling ideas of the book, like why these pictures, why this selection. And just to talk a little bit about um, how like Kafka's work, Kafka only published in his lifetime three things, and they were largely not even noticed. He died unknown um, when he was 40. It wasn't his. That was 1924? Yes, 1924. So 1883 to 1924 was his life. He died of tuberculosis um, at age 40. And um, he gave his works to his friend, Max Brode, and ordered him to burn them. And, and um, Max did not, thank goodness. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> All hail disobedient friends. <laughs> um, so what Max did instead is he published the novels, but everything else was kind of put in suitcases, literally like eight or nine suitcases. And those were, Max just kept. And he, he um, brought some out um, now and then, but there was no order at all. So I, I'm saying that because it's important to know that the linearity of this book is Feingold. That doesn't like, there's no Kafka wanted intended, there's no intended order um, by the author, which is something that we usually um, assume when we're reading a book. And these, um, these parables were compiled and first, and first published in 1990, as far as we know, right? So these parables were not 
uh, published before then, or were they? I think some of them were. In, I actually, piece, yeah, I piecemeal, right? piecemeal, right? Definitely piecemeal, and it was um, so Max gave the works to his secretary, who he also had an amorous relationship with. And um, we didn't really get a hold of all of his works until she died, which was not long ago, but she was 101 when she died. So um, it's only been in the last um, decade or so that the Kafka world has opened up to all this. And you know, his, um, it's very Kafka-esque what is happening to the publication of Kafka. <laughs> Like all these people vying for it, um, the commercialism around his um, around his work, and it's pretty amazing. But um, what Feingold is trying to do in this text is trying to not be theoretical, not to be. Um, he's not going for any sense of accuracy as much as he's trying to create the feeling of existentialism. Um, and so he has put together an order, um, an essay at the beginning of it to kind of tell us what to look for, and then um, the images of Judith Turner. So um, he's really the captain of the ship of this exploration. And I also suspect that there's another captain, maybe a, 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 oh, yeah. an admiral, <laughs> and that would probably be Vincent Fitzgerald. Um, you know the, the publisher. Uh -huh. So behind you know the uh, the translator and the artist and the author, we might have the publisher as well, sort of yeah. maybe orchestrating this um, this approach. All of Fitzgerald's book have this kind of unique uh, quality to them, uh -huh. and I suspect it's it's Fitzgerald's character and his interests coming through in his publications. Yes, he probably. I mean, he may have a bigger editorial position, and but because he's not so much in the book that I'm looking at. I mean, I sat down with this book. Um, so he's even a more um, silent figure. And that there's all these silent authorities, <laughs> it's so Kafka. Yeah, right, Kafka scholarship, yeah. Who's really uh, in the world? Who's yeah. behind it? Yeah, yeah. But I want to get to the ideas of Kafka himself. Um, most people, when they, when they study Kafka, study the short stories. Um, and then get to the novels. So as someone who the read- The trial, metamorphoses, yeah. The castle, um, mm -hmm. and one called America, which right. I think is, is really interesting as well. Um, so the parables are just this tiny little thing that, you know, yeah, they're in there somewhere, but I had never sat down and really thought about and read the parables. Um, in this, in this order or any order, although they came up now and then, and I can't even think of where I saw them. Lisa, what is a parable? It sounds like a biblical thing to me. There are lots of biblical parables, um, but a parable is a, is a story that comes at wisdom in kind of a crab-like fashion, kind of sideways. Oblique. Yeah, so you, um, you're getting this information, but you're supposed to come to the conclusion. Um, there's a lot of chin scratching in parables. <laughs> there's like, uh, um, it's wise, but it's a story about the wisdom. It's not a definitive, it is not. Um, so it, it's, it's a story, usually some kind of narrative, right? But it has a, sub, a meta story. There's a, there's a message or a moral to the story behind it. Sort of like, a, like Aesop's fables, for yes. example, are, are like that. But a parable does not necessarily give a definitive answer, no. right? Like the moral isn't exactly crystal clear in the end. Yes. The parable is, is subject to interpretation. Yes. In fact, it invites interpretation. The participant of the reader is a big part of the, a parable. And the participant of the reader is a big part of this kind of book, this kind of art book. Um, How does that happen with a book like this? Um, well, I mean, you're talking like physically participating in it or? Yes, physically participating in it. Let's get to one of those fold out pages. Um, so, you know, you're reading these little stories that you come at. Let's flip it over and give oh, yeah. folks a, a kind of a sense of what the book, how the book is constructed. So really big, beautiful, um, but mysterious and peopleless photographs, black and white. Every once in a while, there is a um, bright colored, actually only two pages are brightly colored. But then every once in a while, voila, there's this big fold out 
and in this case, just a big fold out of red. <laughs> <laughs> Glorious red. And by the way, let me just interject here that if you're interested in, in checking out this book, uh, open, unfolded, if you will, page by page, you can go to our YouTube channel and Eileen Rafferty beautifully filmed this book being opened um, indeed page by page. So, uh, so spend some time with the book itself. Yeah. So, I mean, even that, there's no words on this page. Let's look at that. The, the unfolding of red. Like, just think, what is the unfolding of red? What does red mean in our culture? It's connections to passion, blood. Um, the parting of the Red Sea. Yeah, yeah. like there's, so this book is just um, chock full of symbols. And those symbols are coming at you as a, as a reader. And, you know, sometimes maybe you only get them this deep, and sometimes they go really deep because of your own knowledge and personal experience. And that's how a parable functions, right? Yes. I mean, everything is symbolic in a parable, and sometimes the symbolism is simple and understandable, and sometimes it's deep and multivalent, right? Yes. I think the word slippage is really important because you're never, like, the state of things is never really certain. There's nothing definitive. So you're always slipping between symbols. There's multiplicity of symbols and you're kind of moving toward those. Seeking meaning, like that's what you're that's what you're looking for. And the words, you know, usually in in Western civilization we put words as, as the primary mode of of transmitting authority. So when the words are slippy as they were are in Slippy. I said that like a Western Pennsylvanian. Slippery. <laughs> Slippagey. <didn't you> <laughs> when the um, when the words are slip slipping around, then you have you know you're on even your footing is is off. So there there's an assumption there that 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 you made, and I don't want to gloss over it, and that is that the primacy of the text in Western culture. Mm -hmm. We think that the word is more definitive, it's clear, it's more precise, it's more objective, even, mm -hmm. it's more eternal, sort of solid mm -hmm. than the image, right? We yes. we we have a, a philosophical tradition that is skeptical of the image because the image is subject to interpretation, the artist. The, the viewers, uh -huh. but the word for some reason is more solid. Yes. So we've given primacy to the text and then the image is secondary. In a work like this, are we seeing both of them as slip, slippy, slippery? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but it's also there his time frame comes in, Kafka's, because the that the word is is, has primacy comes from the Enlightenment era, so like that, that argument is really made in the 18th, 18th century. century forward, yeah. Yeah. So at mon at the point of modernism, which is at the beginning of 20th century, that's when the image starts sort of exerting itself, and the the poetic school of imagism, um, which says that actually image is the the primal form. Right. Um, and it, you get more information, you get better information if you go with the image. So um, Kafka is, is challenging his, his time, like he's a poet of his time by showing how um, language is slippery, how language is not as stable as the Enlightenment thinkers would have it. And he's also a highly imagistic Writer. Yeah. yeah, he is. So he creates, you know, texture and color and, and uh, the things that we expect in the visual arts, we also sort of, mm -hmm. we read those things. Yeah, a lot of um, his stories, he'll just put a, a scene out there. Like he'll describe and he'll go into deep um, detail about the, the, yeah, the stripes of someone's shirt or the type of shoes they were wearing. And all these things are information about that person's class, um, their, whether they're sloven or not, I mean, all about their character, these, these physical descriptions. So that's one of the ways that he's, even though he's writing, um, he is using the image to carry the information of these larger structural meanings. Yeah. So in some ways, a perfect artist to illustrate, a perfect artist yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> It would have been an omission not to have a Kafka book in this book arts exhibit here. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. he is perfect for this. Um, 
Shall we look at the book more, or shall we go to thinking of the structure? You're the captain. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the admiral. <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about the epigraph. So um, usually when you open a book, you try to get some information from the beginning of it. And this is, tells you a little bit about the authorities at work in it. And they give lots of authority to Kafka. He's actually the main, but as I already said, that's a little problematic because these were never intended to be published. The order is up. But, and then they start with um, the epigraph is, uh, is a diary entry. So again, this is something super private something unintended to be read mostly. Certainly in Kafka's case, it was never intended to be read. Um, and that, so this is, this is the first real information we get of, the, of what's going to be going on in this text. And he writes, the monstrous world I have in my head, but how to set myself free and set it free without being torn to bits. And a thousand times better to be torn to bits than to keep it trapped inside me or bury it. This is just what I am here for. To me, this is completely clear. So Kafka is saying his mission in life, the reason he is here in the world, um, is to be about setting himself free from this monstrous world in his head. And we don't have a sense of what that monstrous world is, but that's where we start getting clues to what this book is gonna be about. You know, Lisa, that quotation reminds me a great deal of that image uh, from Goya. It's a print, uh, it was the frontispiece to his caprices mm -hmm. that shows uh, a figure of sea and then owls and bats yeah. coming out. And the title of that is, when, when reason falls asleep, monsters emerge yeah. so out of his out of his mind you know if without the faculty of reason waking reason all kinds of you know critters and, and spookies and whatever come come forth yeah the kafka twist on that would be that those monsters are actually the product of reason uh -huh. there is a perversion of reason and um so the law which kafka was trained as a lawyer um that the law itself is creating these monsters. So he's studying law, he um, becomes a lawyer, and the, that reason itself turns into, it turns into a big ugly. That's a big theme of his, right? Mm -hmm. So if, you, if we use the term, it's Kafkaesque, well, what do we mean by that? We, what we mean is that in the, in the normalcy of our world, in the conventional in our world, mm -hmm there is really chaos and there is really a labyrinth that, that the human being has to negotiate. It's not always, reason is not always rational. It's not always logical. To get from A to Z is not always a straight line. It's almost always circuit. It's Kafka-esque, right? Yeah. And that's, that seems to be a kind of a dominant theme of these parables and, these, and his storytelling, right? Absolutely. And the, um, the idea that reason is is prime, you know, the most, um, the top of the, the apex of thought. Um, he really um, problematizes. Yeah. You used the term existentialism earlier, Alan. Yes. Um, what does that mean? So existentialism quite literally means the, uh, the theories of existence. Um, but he isn't a philosopher, so there are, usually existentialism is boiled down to about five philosophers, and Kafka is included as one of them, but he isn't a philosopher, he's a writer, he's a fiction writer. Um, but existentialism um, looks at the, the mental state of existence, so the felt experience of existing. Um, so it's not the same as like your yoga class and mindfulness, <laughs> which is how to be intentional in your, in your moment. Um, this is like when you're, maybe when you're not being intentional in your moment, maybe, maybe mindfulness is, is um, how to escape ex the existential anxiety, which is the, an angst and anxiety, alienation, these are all kind of the, the lexicon of existentialism. Right. So the human being is somehow being alone in yes. the universe. 
Uh, I mean, we certainly we live in collectives, we live in communities, we live in tribes, etc. But but the existentialist ultimately sees the individual as radically isolated and alone, right? You don't have to be isolated, but you it, it gets down to maybe maybe the quintessential existential um, quote is we all die in our own arms. Um, that no matter how much closeness you have and intimacy with another human being, there's no escaping that we die in our own arms, that there is this self that we have to deal with and we have to, uh, I mean, even in relationships, you have to deal with what you brought to that, what you, and so it, it doesn't mean that you have to be a hermit, not in that kind of alone, but how even in close relationships, you have to own the, the self, and that self, that distance, always brings on an idea of alienation. Um, so it doesn't mean that you are incapable of relationships if you um, are interested in the ideas of existentialism. And certainly Kafka is highly relational. Yes. His figures interact all the time in, in, in all kinds of different ways. But there is that thread that ultimately he's asking the question of what is the purpose and meaning of their individual lives. Yes. And, and the questions that he's asking are frequently about authority and the role of authority, um, and the role of the subject. Um, so it brings up all kinds of ideas of identity. Um, so the communal structures that we create to guide us, to guide our lives, Mm -hmm. Those are often questioned by Kafka. Yes, society. I mean, two of the stories in here. So this um, book has 15 different parables on it. And um, like two or three of them are about structures. About One of them is called building a city. Like how and why do you build a city? One of them is called the um, caravansary, which is just about like, all these caravans that join together and like how they join together. Um, so it, it is society building. Like how do we do this? Why do we do this? Who's yeah. in charge? <laughs> right, and, and Kafka is highly interested in those structures that we, that we create, right? He's highly interested in how we organize ourselves as human beings, how we create communities, how those communities, the rules that communities must follow that individuals within those communities have to follow in order to succeed or to just or to simply survive. Yeah, yeah. And, but he's interested in the the agent of that and your agency. So if you're the the unfortunate protagonist of a Kafka story, um, I mean, they if you're going to be a protagonist in a in a Kafka story, you tend to have certain characteristics. You're smart. You're polite. Your earnest as all get out, um, and um, you do have relationships with people, and you want to be informed. You want to do the right thing. There's an innocence in all the protagonists of Kafka yeah. characters. But you're also out of sync, somehow, with those structures, those pathways yeah. of society. At some point, you're not entirely fitting like a hand in glove with the society in which you live. I mean, is that, is that a biographical issue with Kafka? I mean, do, do we know whether he was in fact perfectly attuned to the Austro-Hungarian empire in which he was born? I mean, how do, how, do we do, how do we make sense of the individual fitting into the, the structures of society? Um, so biographically, Kafka is born um, kind of middle class, um, he is a lawyer, but he has clearly artistic ability, but he's not really permitted to go into um, the arts. And that's maybe the first rub and the first division. So disconnection. Yeah, from, yeah. Right. He's also Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. In a, a, a member of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so a German-speaking Jew mm -hmm. uh, living in, in Bohemia, so the yeah. Slavic country of what later becomes Czechoslovakia or, or the Czech yeah. Republic, right? So there's, there might be other disconnects there as well, right? Yes, when I, um, I went to Prague when I was in my 20s, and I remember um, just realizing, like, I wanted to go to Kafka's house, 
and we took a tour of the castle. And this castle complex is, um, was built like in, began in maybe the 10th century. So for centuries, this castle, it's one of the largest castle complexes. Is that that sheen uh, across yeah. the river, the, the Moldau River, yeah. In, uh... All these architectural forms like just butted up against each other with no, you know, no cohesion. So that lack of cohesion. And then, um, so I remember just like, oh my goodness, there's a, he wrote a book called The Castle and there's a castle right there. Like I, that hadn't occurred to me. And then the Kafka house is, used to be a, um, the quarters for knights, um, clerks. So that he's in this clerk's house writing right next to the castle. This little alleyway, and the, the house sort of, all these little houses tucked in this yeah. little alley right next to the walls of the castle. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can see just walking around that and like the, the centuries of authority just rising up in front of you every time you go out. And, and, and we think about this, this was a Christian kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. And here's this Jewish boy growing up in the proximity to this great power, you know, the central uh, political and religious power of, Bohe of ancient Bohemia. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a big thing in it. And there is a trace of that in the language. If you, as you were talking about, you know, German was his first language. He knew Czech but um, he didn't consider himself fluent in it, but that you are, um, that you're Jewish, which implies a Hebrew language, um, which he doesn't know. But then he's, worth, he's speaking Czech, which he doesn't know well, um, and, and is being, so his main language is German, which is a very authoritarian language. The imperial tongue. Yeah, and all that rough, and he always uses the um, K as the everyman in his story, and you, if you even think visually of the letter K, it's like all these jaggy edges to the, it, like it's the most jaggy letter of the alphabet, and that's the, um, what he uses as his main character, is like K did this, is the protagonist is frequently named K. Um, so, but the distance between languages, um, the philosopher Althusser talks about how language is what creates the symbolic order. Um, like that's the difference between um, a psychotic and uh, someone who is normal psychology is that they operate within an, a symbolic order and that that symbolic order is knitted together through language. And you know, as children, when we were born, we don't know language, but it's our parents that sort of hail us into the symbolic order through language. So if you think of that theory and then that think of how in between languages Kafka is. So his alienation is part of like his relationship to the symbolic order. The linguistic alienation mm -hmm. is part. And so, and, and what I was thinking about is that, that as we learn language, what's actually happened, it's part of socialization. Mm -hmm. We're actually That's being socialized true. into a, a social order yeah. through language. So to be between languages is to be kind of in those spaces between. So, so it, it is a, an alienating force. Mm -hmm. And he could choose to, to go toward a language that maybe he had more heart or feeling toward, um, but to purposely like choose German because there's like this, this authoritative sound to it. And then there's, I, I kind of think of it as an echoing chamber for him. There's a lot more room in that language than what he has in his, more like his heart language. Yeah. And German is a very spacious language. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language that, feels like it expands exponentially. Huh. I mean, you can create new nouns by simply tacking <laughs> things together, stringing All it together. Nouns. So yeah, it's a, it's a very spacious and airy language in so many ways. Yeah. And the Germans were the grammarians. Right. Um, so like right. they were the authorities ooh, of the symbolic ooh, order. Ooh. Yes, 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 indeed. <gasps> oh, how do we get back from there, oh. Raphael? <laughs> We're not even to the intro yet. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's, uh, let's go to the text. Let's read okay. some more text. And, uh... Well, I wanted to read a little bit about, uh, of um, 
Michael Feingold's introduction, because this is where he's giving us the, the angle of approach. And so I wonder if you would read that. I, um, I took a little passage for you there. So this is the editor's note? Yes, and, and read the title of sure. his editor's note, too. So this is Michael Feingold, and he calls us what we are here for, the world, Kafka, and Judith Turner. Remember, Turner is the, uh, the printmaker here, the photographer. The great gate is barred against us, and pounding on it, casually or with intent, is more likely to put us in danger than to help us get in. Indeed, getting in is only likely to put us into more danger. But we try anyway, ceaselessly. We are in danger of the, or the possibility of danger at all times. And if we fail or are destroyed, we have the satisfaction of knowing that it was inevitable. This is life. And Kafka was the first great literary artist to reduce it to its structure, using that structure apophegmically. Oh, I knew I was going to get that word incorrectly. So <laughs> apothematically as the ground base for fiction. So much has been written about how and why he came to this achievement, that further speculation, adding another voice to the ceaseless psychobabble, seems futile even for Kafkans. The main point is that Kafka was right, and the world knows it. What he described as being life has entered the modern soul as an accurate picture of our experience. I think that's really interesting. Do you see how he's just leading us? Yeah. Um, I, I think his um, adding another voice to the ceaseless psychobabble. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be another interpretation on top of interpretation on top of That's interpretation. That's a self-referential comment by Feynman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it's interesting that he basically says that Kafka has the meaning of life. That, that life, that his interpretation of life is a, the correct or potentially the most correct interpretation. The world is Kafka-esque. It is. The modern world is Kafka-esque. Ah, okay. So it's not the same question as Socrates was asking, um, because this is the apotheosis. This is the culmination of Western civilization. This is all those decisions for thousands of years, um, all that authority, all that patriarchy has brought us to this moment where there is a perversion of reason where there is um, all this alienation and emptiness in our culture. Um, so maybe if we had made different decisions between Socrates and Kafka, we would have the answer to life, but this is the answer to modern life. Right, so K, this representative figure that is pervasive in his writings, is in some ways is carrying on his shoulders uh, the weight of all these decisions, all these questions that Western man, to use that word as a cliche, uh, that Western man has been basically carrying around for a couple thousand years. Yes, and that's why we are all Kafka. We are, we are all um, in, this, in this state because we have inherited this history. We, have, we are the products of Western civilization. So no matter how much we try to be our innocent flame of existence, with good intentions and no matter, we still have this weight of these thousands of years of customs and traditions and authorities. Like we can't shake them, they're, they're part of our existence. I'm actually, I'm glad you mentioned America, Kafka's text. I'm, I'm anxious to reread it because yeah. I think we think of America as forever young, forever new. And, and of course, I, I suspect that the argument is that really we are the heirs to just like anyone else in the modern world, we are heirs to all the baggage. We're not free of the old world by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, in some ways, we are the epitome of all the old world's problems. You know, we're yeah. carrying all those things with us. But there was something that America was able to do by coming over here, and um, as we were able to, like, get ourselves out of the shadow of the literal castle. Yes. Um, and so we don't have the visual cues that. Kafka or Europeans do. So we put this on the landscape. We like there's theories and books about like sure. how we take those old world values and put them on and and our own genocide of Native Americans. Um, like that is bringing those old world things and applying to to what is here. 
But we thought that our democracy, our newfangled version of a very old concept, you know, both Greek and Roman, that somehow that made us new. And we, it was a fresh idea, you think, in the 18th century, this idea that people Absolutely. could govern themselves, that they could, that, that their, their political destinies, um, their freedoms, if they could claim freedom, that the individual could claim freedom for themselves and determine what their, de what their destiny could be. That, was, that felt so fresh. It yeah. still does for most of the world. Yeah. And it felt like a complete disregard of the ancien regime, the old order of Europe. But again, that's it's it's highly suspicious, you know, in the in in a Kafka s sense. I think that the American dream, um, if you want to think of the the those characters, those protagonists in his stories, as as having this renewed American dream, like what does I, I think there's a real correlation there, like that that fresh innocence and earnestness that they're bringing, like in whatever their situation in these stories, they're bringing this good intention, fresh innocence. Um, that is the American dream. Like as an American reading this, you're like, oh, I, I recognize that. As an immigrant reading this, yeah. I mean, I understand what that dream is about. It's refashioning oneself, being yeah. reborn, being born again. Yeah, the capacity for it as, as like someone born of very humble means, like to, to be able to go to college and, and like that, that dream that you can pull yourself out of bad situations and renew. Um, that is the myth of innocence in a way. The, like, can we ever really escape these thousands of years that we inherited? It's freedom is a big theme for uh, Kafka. Yeah. These parables are loaded with this concept of how do I free myself? Yeah. How do I extricate myself from the, the shackles yeah. of society? I mean, that's what Feingo, Feingold um, started with. Like, how do I set myself free um, without being torn to bits? What's going to tear him to bits? It's that past. It's the thousands of years of authority and past and customs and societal norms. You know, you said um, earlier the, the cliche of man. It's actually not a cliche in here. Um, there's not many female characters. Um, not that you would ever want to, you know, this is not exactly an argument that I'm going to fight for to be a protagonist in a Kafka story, <laughs> but there aren't very many women, and I think that that's purposeful because this is a patriarchy, yeah. and he's telling the story of the consequence of thousands of years of patriarchy, mm -hmm. and the women in these um, stories are helpless. Right. And so the, the male figure, which the protagonist in the Kafka story is typically a young male, right, mm -hmm. sort of a prime of life male, um, is, uh, is symbolic, a kind of an iconic mm -hmm. representation of humanity as a whole. Yes. Uh, but, but I think you're right, Kafka doesn't necessarily, uh, does he explore gender very much? Not much. In his most famous story, The Metamorphosis, um, where he turns into a giant insect, um, this is the one story most people know. Um, at the, he has a sister, and he frequently, these characters often have sisters. Um, and those sisters don't have speaking parts too much, but um, they're there. Um, but after Kafka has descended into the dehumanizing process, so he's a, a clerk and his parents are relying on him. Um, so his name's Gregor Samson. His parents are relying on him to make money and he just, like he become, he's lost his humanity so much that he becomes an insect. Um, and then there's this whole struggle between the family and they're like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Our, we've lost our provider, our young male provider. Um, and so they're, they're in an existential crisis. What do we do now? And they go on this train ride, I can't remember why, but um, the story ends with the sister jumping up and um, like leaning and stretching and the parents both look at her body like, and then kind of nod to themselves, like, this is our next ticket. But it's not, it's not her work. Like, Gregor had to go to work and get in there and clerk and um, do things that suffocated his humanity. For the sister, it's her body that's going to get her, because that body is going to buy her a husband, and that husband's going to be the provider. Um, so that's the role of women. <laughs> but it's awareness. It's definitely uh, a smart awareness of gender, um, 
but that's his topic is um, the the culmination of this patriarch. Yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, where do we go from here, Raphael? <laughs> well, uh, we could read uh, a, a short parable. If you we should, should read a parable. We should read a parable. Um, how about reading the parable of parables on parables? So this is the first parable in the book, and it's called On Parables. You want me to read it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Many complain that the words of the wise, time and again, are only parables, not applicable to daily life. And that is the only kind we have. When the wise man says cross over, he doesn't mean that we should go to the other side, which we could always do anyway, if it was worth the effort. Instead, he means some imaginary other place, something that we don't know about and that he himself can't describe any more clearly either and therefore can't help us with at all. All these parables really just want to say that the inconceivable is inconceivable. And we already knew that. But the problems we have to deal with every day are quite different. On this point, someone said, why do, why do you all hesitate? If you would just follow the parables, then you would become parables yourselves and be free of all your daily problems. Someone else said, I bet that's a parable too. The first one said, you win. The other one said, but unfortunately only in the parable. The first one said, no, in reality, in the parable, you lose. <laughs> so you see a circularity going on in, in the slippage of language um, and the reality. And is this just the logic of the parable or is this the logic of reality? And what is the connection? Is there a Venn diagram in there? Well, it strikes me as almost postmodern, this idea that like, if you can't trust the real world, then you certainly can't trust the parable version of the real <laughs> world. So if both of them nice. are untrustworthy, then there is no truth. There is yeah. no reality that we can count on. I mean, the assumption is that there is a reality here and the parable mirrors that reality perfectly. That's, that's what we would expect. But I think Kafka starts with the idea that the parable is shaky, right? The language is slippery. And if that's true of the parable, then it's also true of the real world, of the totality. Yeah. So it's all slippery. And that, um, I, and this goes back to a theme for, for this book, is that the reality is a construction. And so if you look at the, this is where we get into Judith Turner. Let's look at some of these pictures. Sure. Um, if you look at the photos in the book, they're all about structures. So look at this big set of staircase. Um, and just think about like what that staircase looks like. Like where would a staircase like that be? I mean, to me, it reminds me of the staircase going up in front of the Lincoln Monument. Um, like this is a museum staircase. This is, this Marble. isn't, yeah, yeah. And um, it's worn around the edges, but it's very constructed. And that's what he's getting at, um, is that there are constructions, even natural constructions. They have to, they're part of the reality, but what they're doing there is maybe uncertain. Let's look at some of these other ones. I look, I'm not sure what that is. I think it's a staircase in the dark. Mm -mm -mm. And every once in a while they put the, Put a, like there's some color pages, and this one is matched up to uh, a, a parable called the Green Dragon. And this is the most literal and heavy-handed that he gets. Um, and I was surprised by that. Like, really? It's called a Green Dragon, and you're going to put a green piece of paper next to it? <laughs> a textured <laughs> green piece of paper, yeah. Um, but he's usually very, very subtle. These, this is like the only heavy-handed moment. Um, this is a really beautiful, um, these gates, and it's a fold-out. Um, and it's actually on a fourth page back here. So not only is this, um, there's references to gates all through here, because how you get into these structures 
structures are through gates. And at some of these city building um, parables that he has here, you go through an arch and you um, think you're lost and you turn around and you go through another arch, but it wasn't the same arch and that gets you in a different courtyard and now you don't know where you are so you have to ask direction to the policeman and the policeman tells you to go to the first gate but you can't find the first gate. I mean, so gates so and- I think, I think, I often think of the labyrinth yeah. when I read Kafka, this idea that you're lost and you can't find your way out of the labyrinth somehow. Yeah, and then there's all these symbols of progress. There's always these symbols Mark. of um, yeah, I, I should say signals. Uh, yeah, markers of progress, markers of going forward, but you're not really going forward. It's a circuitous route. Yeah. Um, and of course, Prague is like that. Yes. I mean, if you get lost in those medieval neighborhoods, it's like sometimes it's hard to backtrack. There's nothing rational. There's no grid no. in a city like Prague. I, I looked at this, went back and looked at it because on the Jewish cemetery, the old Jewish cemetery in, in Prague, there is a gate that has a lot of this ironwork. And I was like, did she actually take a picture? Is this a, an actual reference? But I don't think it is. But it's very much like the one in... You know. it's, it's really ironic that the, the Jewish cemetery is in the only part of, of the city, that is the new city, that is laid out rationally. The rest of it's a medieval city. And uh, so the Jewish neighborhood was laid out as a grid but its cemetery is not as <laughs> far from, you know, rational and grid-like. I have to tell you the story about being in Prague um, after we're done looking at the <laughs> there is. So this is a, another fold-out that shows um, a cityscape. Um, and these seem to be uh, escape ladders, right? Um, but they look dangerous. They look um, mysterious. Uh, I'm not sure I would want to climb any of them. The top is cut off, so you don't really know where they go. So in, in this way, these, um, these images that they've chosen for here really speak to the existential. Yeah, and he's trying to um, echo that, to bring you in closer. I mean, I really think that the, I, the idea that Feingold or Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald yeah. um, have here is, I don't want to teach you existentialism. I want you to feel it. I want you to drop into the felt experience. To lose yourself in it, yeah. And by the way, I just want to notice that the, the, photo, the photo reviewer, this technique that we're looking at here, I mean, I, I know what you're seeing there from across the screen is just these black and white images, but really these are sumptuous prints. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're photographs that are etched on copper plates uh, they're using a UV uh, uh, light technique. This is a 19th century technique. So it's, it was a technique invented in Kafka's time, hmm. used in, you know, in the late 20th century to produce this book. So it's really just gorgeous. The, 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 the blacks are so rich here. The whites are so, so stark. Um, so they're toothy. They're toothy. <laughs> you, can, you can lose yourself in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the texture of, of this reality. So it's a felt experience as well as a physical experience. Yeah, and look on this one, he has um, printed one of the parables in the middle of this photograph. I think that is, um, is really beautiful. And that particular, um, that particular parable is called Forget It, and it's about trying to get directions from a police officer, and the police officer just laughing at you, like, I'm no authority. Um, so, uh, again, to, to place it in this image of all this scaffolding that seems to go nowhere and it seems unsturdy and um, difficult, dangerous. Um, that's. Yeah, it's like it's telling. Said, danger. To, to get <laughs> yeah. in is to put yourself into more danger. And then um, that's about the end of the book for images. Um, I'll tell you my um, going to Prague story because, so I went and um, took this tour of the castle and then wanted to go to the house. Um, and I had taken this, fr this fellow traveler with me named Rose and she was a lot younger than me and very innocent and um, she didn't know who Kafka was and I kept, um, you know, I was clearly having this wonderful experience and. Um, like discovering that he lived right outside a castle and I was like we have to go to the house so I drag her over there and she's like who's Kafka why you know why are you 
I was like, well, he's really important, but she was getting this sense of importance. And I'm like, no, he's really humble. Um, so we go to his house. I get nothing of the experience from the house, and I'm really frustrated that I can't convey to her what existentialism is and what why Kafka is so important to me. <laughs> um, like, I, I'm just failing at conveying this to her. And we, um, we walk around and we go to the Jewish cemetery, which is just um, generations from like the 8th century to the 12th century of, of tombstones just stacked in some places 12 deep. Um, and these, the, the ground is buckled and there's trees growing through it and there's medieval animals carved, uh, like those weird lions with human faces. And, just, and there's four different languages coming out at you. And at one point, I look over at Rose, like this innocent little flame of Rose, the Daisy Miller, <laughs> the American Daisy Miller standing in this like five centuries of symbols coming at you. And I was like, this is existentialism. This is the feeling of existentialism. Like all this torrent of symbology and signals coming at you and you're not quite sure what to make of it. So, you know, that visit did more than walking through the castle, which is kind of a direct reference, walking through the Kafka house, like standing in that cemetery is where you could get that. You know, Kafka is almost always depicted as, you know, a dark humorist, as a pessimist, uh, as, you know, uh, how do you, how do you access someone who comes to us with a, um, with a kind of obtuse, a dark view of, of existence? I think that Kafka is ultimately hopeful. Um, and I think that's true because he's a truth teller. He was writing this truth, not caring whether anybody wrote it, read it, not caring whether it was published and he became a famous author. Um, he was describing the human experience, which is all artists, that's all we ever ask of artists, is help us understand what it is to be human. So Kafka did that. And if you're out there in the world and you are experiencing loneliness or alienation or disconnects, then Kafka is your message in a bottle saying you are not alone. What you're, you're not crazy. Um, you're not weird, you, you're human. You're human. This, is, this is the human condition. And don't, like, you have a friend. Kafka's a great friend because he gives you comfort that you're not crazy about the human condition. Um, so I don't see this as dark. I see this as understanding life and understanding our role in the world as, um, as these earnest intelligent people trying to have purposeful, meaningful lives. You have to understand the slippage as well. And, and that's what he brings us into. Well, Elisa, we've come to the end of our program. What? I know, it feels like we just got started. I have pages. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much more, right? Yes, there is. So I want to thank you. This has been really, really wonderful. So rich, so dense. Uh, and I want to thank you, our, our participating audience. Uh, thank you for joining us in this wonderful series. I want to thank Vincent Fitzgerald and Dan Weinberg uh, and, uh, and all these amazing authors and artists that have, have uh, made this, uh, this remarkable set of books come together. Uh, I also want to thank James Todd, uh, the <laughs> wonderful artist Jim Todd, who brought Kafka to us and, uh, through this beautiful print. Um, and uh, opened up the world of Kafka to us. So Absolutely. thank you. Thanks for joining us in this series. And if you're interested, again, I just want to uh, invite you to check out the virtual tour of our exhibition. Uh, and you can do that by going to umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum, umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum, and check out our videos, including this one, on our YouTube channel. So thank you and take very good care.